sleep from 9 to 8 every work day No fun at night, gotta hit the hay But on Friday, now you've worked all week long It's time to get out and say what's up, Hong Kong Hi, welcome to What's Up Hong Kong, the show where we tell you what's going on in Hong Kong this week and meet some of Hong Kong's most interesting people. It's March 19th, and our guest today is Hong Kong stand-up comedian, uh, comedy sensation, Vivek Mabubani. How are you? What's up, Travis? How are you today? Very well. Uh, And uh, I guess you're feeling a little bit under the weather yourself. A little bit. I'm doing the whole typical Hong Kong weather change, getting sick deal. You know, it's a regular thing. Everyone does it. It's, It's in trend right now. That's right. We we love the uh, changing weather patterns and the pollution exactly. as far as you our... You inhale uh, it properly, <laughs> you inhale it the right technique, and you can get sick properly. Hooray! All right. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for joining me. Let's learn a little bit more about our guest. Tell us a bit about yourself, Vivek. Um, first of all, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, which makes me a very local person, yet I'm actually Indian. Uh, the interesting thing about me is that I actually grew up and went to a Chinese school, which I learned Cantonese, and now I'm as fluent as any other local kid over here. Sweet. Yeah, so it's it's a superpower to me, really. You know, <laughs> right. people look at me, they're like, "No, he can't understand." And I open my mouth, they're like, "Oh my god, he actually speaks it." No, um, I I've been doing stand up comedy for around five and a half years now. Uh, I I it was one of those things where I just wanted to try it out. You know, those bucket list things where I thought, "Oh, I'm gonna die one day soon, so let me try it out before I die." Sure. And I did it, and I liked it so much that I just kept at it. And from then, it's been five and a half years, and hopefully, I've improved five and a half years worth of comedy. Excellent. And did you were you really into stand up comedy as far as watching it and taking it in before you started doing it yourself? I was very big on free comedy in the sense that if it was on T V, the free channels, I'd watch it. If it was not let's say online, the free sources like say YouTube and all that, I would sure. watch it. So yeah, I was very big with comedy. I grew up watching Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Seinfeld. Uh, Simpsons, all these shows, and to me, comedy was necessary. Uh, every night before sleeping, I would need to watch some comedy to just enjoy the rest of the day and go to sleep well, you know. So, for me, comedy was very much a part of my life. It was one of those things that I liked it so much and admired comedians that I thought, you know what, I have to try. How how can you just go on stage, just a mic and your voice, and speak and entertain people for a whole hour? I gotta give it a shot. All right. And do you have any? Who are your comedian influences your comedy influences as far as stand up well growing up they were always like uh jerry seinfeld chris rock eddie murphy you know the classics uh i actually got into richard pryor and george carlin later on okay however nowadays i'm very big on bill burr kevin hart louis ck everyone knows louis ck as well by now and so a lot of these guys nowadays are, are top top comedians for me and i also, the comics that fly into Hong Kong, like, say, Butch Bradley, Paul Ogata, all these big names for me are just, yeah. oh, my God, great to watch. Got to see Butch Bradley last month. is really excellent. I'd, it's yeah, fantastic. He'll be back, too, so anyone listening. Yeah, especially listening. if you're in the front row. <laughs> if you're sitting in the front row, he picks on you. It's a, it's a pleasant way of getting I was in on. the front row, actually. Me and my grandfather, he, he destroyed my grandfather. It was so, it was so funny. It was a good relationship, <laughs> you know. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so... Just as far, you know, the show's about Hong Kong, getting into it, what do you love about Hong Kong? I really like that Hong Kong is a place where you can get everything done in a day. Literally to the point that you can wake up, go for a hike up the mountain, come back home, eat some breakfast, go for a shower, do some work, go out for lunch, have a meeting, go for a, go for a movie in the afternoon, come back, do some work, maybe even go out, go for another jog, and then go to the beach, see the sunset. You can go for a massage after that. You come back, work some more. You can go watch a comedy show at night, come back, go have a drink, and then go clubbing, and then pass out, wake up, take a taxi home, and realize it's been a, just a day. <laughs> Yeah, you can definitely cram a lot into it, and you know the uh, the public transportation around here really helps with with that. Exactly, and <laughs> it's cheap. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, very cool. And we, you actually just got done. I'm interviewing here at Takeout Comedy in Soho, and you just got done teaching a class in Cantonese stand-up yeah. comedy. I, I I teach regular Cantonese foundation level stand-up comedy classes for locals who are interested to try it, but they don't really know where to start. So it's very interesting for me because I'm an Indian speaking in Cantonese, teaching a lot of local Chinese how to be funny in Cantonese. You know, okay. so it's, it's it's a weird thing in itself, but it it works where a lot of people they might see it as oh my god, this is a crazy art form go on stage to make people laugh but actually you know there's this technique and if you understand you break it down you know it's actually not that hard yeah have you taught english uh stand-up as well 
I have taught it in like uh, local educational institutions like uh, Hong Kong UST and all that. Sure. I've gone to a lot of Toastmaster gatherings and been like the guest lecturer or okay. guest speaker there. So I've done those, but mostly I focus on the Cantonese side. Is there a challenge in teaching aspiring local Chinese uh, comedians as opposed to Westerners? Oh, definitely, because the culture of stand-up comedy in Cantonese is very different from, let's say, in English. Um, when people come to watch a show in English, they have the mindset that, oh, okay, this is going to be like, let's say, four or five comedians. It's going to be a fun time. We'll be having a drink and watching the show. It's going to be great, you know. Whereas with a lot of locals, they're used to the format of its annual performance. If we go there to watch this one person speak for two hours. He's going to talk about funny stuff for not the next two hours. So let's be respectful. Let's enjoy the show. Let's not interrupt them. No heckling, all that kind of stuff. So it's just to twist their mindset and make them realize, look, you don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to have two hours of material. You can have three minutes of funny stuff and you're on stage telling it to strangers. So it's just basically letting them know that cult that comedy culture is really big. It's not just limited to what we've seen here very common in Hong Kong. Okay. And I'd also like to get your thoughts on what it takes to appeal to both Chinese and Western audiences. Well, first thing, whatever language it is, really being funny is the key. That everyone knows, right? However, what I've realized is that uh, with uh, foreigners and locals, the difference is I change my personality a bit when I'm on stage. When I'm on stage in an English show, I kind of look at it from a perspective of I'm a person who lives in Hong Kong and I find Hong Kong really weird. You know, there's a lot of weird things. People have weird English names. They, they you know, they, they, they travel differently. You know, a lot of these different minor details. It's the weirdest English name you've heard here. My favorite though is like a photosynthesis. <laughs> yeah. Really? She was a short girl. <laughs> I thought, okay, you know, maybe you should go out, get some sun, grow, you know. Yeah, she's got but some chloroplast. Yeah, exactly. I, basically, in Hong Kong, it's a game of Scrabble. When he, when you give birth, he's like, <laughs> he's called a rekda. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter. What's going to get more points? Let's do that. You know, <laughs> There's that. And then when I'm doing a Chinese show, I go up there with the perspective of I'm a local. I'm as local as any other guy, but I'm always going to be a foreigner. Sure. No matter how I try. So I talk about life where everyone relates to it, but at the same time, I say, you know what? You know, like you would think, okay, you know, being a foreigner, speaking Cantonese, it's awesome. It's a great thing. But no, it's, it's horrible. You know, it gets me in so much trouble. People get upset that I speak Cantonese, you know, <laughs> when I don't tell them. And they're like, oh, why did you tell me to speak Cantonese? Oh, my God, you made me speak in English. I hate you. Oh, get out. You know, <laughs> like, I'm just trying to help out, man. Relax. Yeah, right. So there's all those different perspectives that people can relate to better. Okay, excellent. And uh, so do you have any tips for aspiring comedians? People have already got into it a little bit. What, what does it take to really uh, kind of be semi-successful at stand-up? Well, I would say the first thing is just to believe in yourself, that you can be funny. Every night when I go on stage, before I get up there, I just tell myself, look, I've worked so hard. I put in so much time and effort into writing these stories and these funny bits. It would be a disrespectful to myself to go up there and go like, oh, you know what? Maybe this might make you laugh. I'm going to go up there and say, you know what? This is going to be hilarious. You're going to love it. That's number one. And number two really is just going up there and doing it. It's one of those things like, you know, if you want to learn how to swim, you have to go to a pool and swim. You can't sit in your bathtub. You can't read books and watch videos and study and all that. It's, it's no use. You have to just do it. So it's one of those things that when you get on stage and you do stand-up comedy, you'll kind of go, oh I, oh, I see what's going on now. Oh, that's why the guy did that when that happened. Oh, because I get what he's doing now. I see, I see. So it's one of those things that you just have to just go for it. Okay. Uh, so if you could improve one aspect of the local comedy scene here in Hong Kong, what would it be? Uh, if I could improve one aspect of the local comedy scene here in Hong Kong, it would have to be people coming into a show and changing their mindset from, I can talk to, let's see how funny you are, into, you know what, I want to have a good time. I want to just come down and just laugh a bit. Very often we have shows where people come down with a challenging mindset. They come with their arms crossed. They're like, you know what, I'm going to pay some money and see how good you really are. <laughs> Which is interesting because I'm like, well, you already paid, so I win. <laughs> but you know. Have you had problems with hecklers? Uh, we've had hecklers in the sense that it's very passive-aggressive hecklers with local audiences. They won't shout and interrupt you, but they will in interrupt you with their eyes. They're looking at you going, yeah, not that funny. <laughs> right. I could do better than that. You know, they'll be thinking that with their eyes. But I actually find that more, of an, uh, more, more thrilling to me because when I can make someone who's got their arms crossed and their eyes looking at me going like, I can speak too. And they're like, okay, that was pretty funny. I actually, that was, it was it's got to be off-putting though because nobody else in the crowd can see their face, that one person, unless you're going to point them out and be like, man, what are you looking exactly. at me like that for? I mean, I've had situations where there was a person sitting near the back of the room and he had his arms crossed the whole night. And I picked on him a bit where I was like, "Why, sir, why do you have your arms crossed? And he just he just let open them up. And I was like, no, no, that's okay. You know, maybe you have a, erect nipples. I don't know. You know? <laughs> you know, and I was joking with him. I was like, you know, I know you do MC work and maybe you're just here to study stuff. But, like, you know, when you do MC, do you have your arms crossed as well? You know, you just cross your arms like, and now in the red corner, we have this guy. <laughs> oh, look at him. Big deal. Woo, you know. So I, I can pick on that. At the same time, I never try to go up there and hurt anyone. There's never an, an 
I never want to go up there and offend anyone. There's no reason for me to be offensive. If you cross your arms, that's your choice, you know. Maybe one day I'll watch a show and I'll cross my arms as well. It's my choice. It's my freedom, right? However, my goal really is to make someone who came down here with the mindset of, I don't know if this guy's funny. I'm just going to sit here and, you know, shake my leg and cross my arms and see, and see what's going to happen. And if I can make that guy unfold his arms and go, all right, this is a good show, then you know what? That was perfect. Mission accomplished. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, so you've achieved a level of success in Hong Kong with regards to entertainment that few or perhaps even no one else of your stand-up, as far as your stand-up comedy peers, have been able to achieve. Do you think it's possible to achieve such a level of success without being able to speak fluent Chinese? Um, I think the, the fluent Cantonese definitely helps me a lot. A lot of people in Hong Kong know me for my Cantonese stand-up. They want to see like an Indian guy speaking Cantonese and making us laugh. That's, that's something special. However, I do believe that if you're funny, you're funny in the sense that there's always going to be an audience for you. I, I've done a lot of Toastmaster events where I'm the guest speaker and it's fully in English. They don't want to hear me speaking Cantonese because this is a group of people who want to do public speaking in English. And they ask me because they, they've seen my comedy show in Cantonese or they see my comedy show in English and they want to, you know, have me run a workshop or basically break down how I come up with my comedy or how I go about speaking. So I do believe there definitely is, is a level of success waiting for you, whatever language it is. However, I got to admit it. The Cantonese definitely helps boost it a lot. I, I, I don't want to lie about it. On the flip side, I guess I should say that being uh, also having native level English, it must well, also make it possible. It definitely <laughs> helps. I mean, oddly enough, if you have really poor English, that's actually a good thing. One of the winners of the English comedy competition one year had really poor English. You know who I think my my favorite, who uh, probably the guy that uh, I really enjoy his jokes the most here in Hong Kong is Andrew Chu. Exactly, that's and Andrew he Chu. He doesn't have perfect. He English, has he has really bad English, and he actually won the English competition because it was just so bizarre seeing someone with that kind of English speak about certain topics. And you're like, this is hilarious. The funny thing is that the same year he won English, the Chinese competition was won by a Caucasian. Oh, really? Yeah, who had really poor Cantonese, so there you go. <laughs> you know, Caucasian winning Cantonese, Chinese winning English. It's a top tipsy, crazy world. <laughs> Racist audiences. I what didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so actually, we should probably point out for people that aren't familiar with you that you have your credentials are you have won Hong Kong's Funniest Comedian for both English and Chinese previously. Yeah, actually, the, the interesting thing is when I first started back in 2007, I joined both the English and Cantonese competition. I only won the Cantonese in 2007, which made the funniest... Oh. Oh, damn. I know, right? The funniest <laughs> Chinese person in Hong Kong was an Indian. Uh, go figure. <laughs> and then in 2008, I joined again, and I, I got the English title as well. And after that, I kind of figured, oh, you know what? I get it. I get the game. You know, I'll, I'll just I'll just be a, another comedian. It's good enough for me. And for me, uh, the title it's more about just being funny continuously. The consistency is more what th gives me that thrill rather than winning titles and all that. So, so you're not going for the dynasty. Uh, if there if there is a dynasty, I will take it. I have no problem with that. But like I said, well, I can mean, we expect to see you in in competition more in the coming years? Uh, joining as a competitor, I don't think so, because very often I get the guest spot at the end. Okay, so I'm nice. like, well, you know, I don't want to compete with myself, you know. So <laughs> uh, funny both ways. No, I I would put it this way. Like for me, I see it as if I win another title, that really doesn't do anything. It actually, I would rather someone else get a chance, give them the title, give them the credentials, and hopefully boost their career as well. True. That really to me is what I I enjoy more. Well, it's very humble of you. Oh, no, it's, I already won. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> All right. Uh, so has your celebrity got to the point yet where random people come up to you on the street and ask to take your picture, anything like yes, that? Yes, I get a lot of that where people randomly come up to me on the streets. However, usually before taking a picture, they always ask me, are you that guy that does comedy? <laughs> right. And I'm like, really? Like, is that what you're going to tell me? Are you the, the guy? And I could see, no, I'm not the guy. They're like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, you all look the same. I don't know. Yeah. So I've had people come up. I've had people who... Uh, wanted to take a picture with me. I've had people who wanted to take a picture with me while I speak in Cantonese. They're like, I'll keep speaking. I'm like, you know how a camera does, does work, right? It, <laughs> right? it doesn't record sound. You know that, right? You can't take a snapshot of your words. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've had that. I've had people walk past me and just try to guess my name. I've had people who are like, oh my God, I love your stuff. You're, you're hilarious. You're my idol. What's your name? <laughs> how do I say your name? I don't know how to say your name. And they're like, hey, you know what? That's interesting. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, so how's your film career been doing here? It's actually it's pretty good. I, I do a lot of uh, different projects. I do, I range from student projects all the way up to like I've been cameo roles in feature films where I wasn't like the big diehard main character. Right. But um, I've done a lot of student films. I actually enjoy doing student film projects a lot because. It's a learning process for everybody. What's your uh, filmography? What might it, we have seen you in? Um, there's a there's a movie called All's Well Ends Well 2009, which is Sky Yao Heisi Yi Leng Leng Gao. It's an, a Chinese film that always comes out in uh, Chinese New Year. 
And I was one of the cameo roles there back when I had much longer hair and more hair f for that matter. <laughs> I've done a lot of student projects. Like I just recently did a, a, sh a movie, a short film with a Baptist University student. Uh, the, mo the movie is called Give Happiness a Chance. And it's in the Hong Kong International Film Festival in the university section. It's going to be aired over there. So I was actually in the magazine, the catalog. I was like, hey, that's me. Look at me. Hey. <laughs> so I've got that. I mean... The more popular films I've done with this one short YouTube clip called Yaf Fan Zhong, which is basically part of the Li Ka Shing Foundation, where they gave money to people to do video clips that were m more positive, to give a positive message. And I was the main character there talking about the importance of one minute. And the story is interesting because it was me trying to sell a, an electronic can opener. And this guy was like, well, why do I need an electronic can opener? It just saves me a minute. I'm not going to buy an electronic can opener for a minute. I'm like, do you know the importance of a minute? You know what you can do in a minute? And I just go on and on about it. And the guy's like, fine, I'll take one. I'm like, yes. Now, were you just riffing there? They actually written, had everything written they, out They for had you? most of it written down. I mean, they, they gave me some leeway of like how to go about it, maybe add my own little touch to it. Sure. However, it was mostly written down. I had this big green bow tie. A lot of people know me from that. They're like, are oh, you the guy with the green bow tie? I'm like, yeah. Speaking of which, uh, do you do any improv comedy? I don't do much of improv actually. I uh, for me, stand up comedy is really my thing. Improv has never has never been like a super heavy duty interest of mine in the sense that it's never been something I'm like, oh my god, whose line is anyway so funny? I gotta do that. I love it, you know. Right. But it's coming back. Yeah, it is. It the, is. I know the it's American version without Drew yeah. Carey. I know. I yeah, like, yeah, without Drew Carey. Right, go. That's, uh, I have no problem. <laughs> Still so, has Wayne Brady. Yeah, thankfully, <laughs> you know that that's the key. You gotta have Wayne Brady over there, you know. Yeah. But yeah, improv for me, I I I do enjoy watching it though. I definitely appreciate it. I have tried it, and it's definitely a different art form. A stand-up comic may not be very good at improv, and an improv comic may not be very good at stand-up. So it's the, the worlds do col do collide. However, you could be very exclusive if you need to. Yeah, there are different skills, and definitely. people who can do both are pretty talented. Exactly. <laughs> definitely. Um, okay, my well, my coworker is a huge uh, metal fan. Yeah, and he's heard your band Eve of Sin a little bit, and he says that you're not technically heavy metal or metal core music, but a mix of styles. What would you say the band style is? How would I, you describe it? I would I would put it this way: is like, we're, yeah, we're not we're not really heavy metal. We're not really metal core. It's more like. Uh, a little bit of groove metal at most, but I wouldn't even say it's groove metal. It's very hard to judge. It's more just headbanging metal. Yeah. You know, just stuff that you're like, all right, let's beat to it. Let's get school crazy, man. Let's hit someone, you know. <laughs> like, for me, I really enjoy music that makes me want to hit something. Okay. Like, my favorite band is... Like Ky who? Oh, my, my favorite band <laughs> is Chimera and Lamb of God. And whenever I hear those songs, I'm like, I want to beat someone. I just, I just want to hit a wall, you know. Definitely. Then I Then my logical mind comes in like, no, you will not hit a wall because your hand will hurt. <laughs> if your hand hurts, you will not be happy. But if you're not happy, you will need to be. You will need to do something else, you know. Yeah. And I'm all good. But uh, yeah, those are my favorite songs. And my band, I'm the drummer of the band, and so. Right. I like that 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 beat that dun dun ta dun 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 ta that kind of beat where it's just like yeah yeah we're we're coming for you you know that sort of thing I love that. Yeah, and uh, it's good being here in Hong Kong. There's lots of good hard rock acts that come through, but you you never have like the giant like Ozfest, big metal festival that it, you no, know, no, no. sea of metalheads. Yeah, the thing for Hong Kong is that metal is actually getting bigger in the sense that it's still underground, very much underground. If you know where it is, then you know where to go. Like there's a place called Hidden Agenda. Sure. And there's all these different venues that run a lot of metal events. And you can always check out Underground HK. Exactly, UndergroundHK.com. You've actually designed the yeah, website, that was my website for them, yeah, right? That's my project. <laughs> uh, there you go, you know. So a lot of this is available. Hong Kong is one of these cities where there's so much happening that its chances are it's not that it doesn't exist. You just can't find it. You know, it's like another Google. You just have to know how to find it, really. You know, yeah. it's not that it doesn't exist. However, um, I would say for big acts to come to Hong Kong, it's hard because the audience isn't really there in Hong Kong. It's more sure. like, let's say, in Taiwan, Japan, China, mainland China, all that stuff. So, like, for example, when I wanted to go watch Lamb of God, I had to fly to Taiwan with my friends just to go watch them. Dang. It was yeah. so worth it. Uh, my favorite band is not a hard hard metal act, but they're called 311. They're oh, state, that, yeah, the that, they're, they're quite old school. I, 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 yeah, back in the 90s, they were pretty popular. Their logo is pretty they're cool. still going on. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like the logo. Uh, graffiti uh, feel to it. the closest they ever get is Japan, so that's where I would I have to fly to if enough. I ever wanted to see them. Um, okay, so will we have a chance to see Eve of Sin live this year? Uh, this year, chances are no. The reason is because we've all grown older. We've all kind of accepted the reality that look. Oh, uh, what kind of attitude is that? I know, right? We're all like, hey, guys, I got to settle down. You know, times have changed. Ozzy's still going. I know. I, I, so I told them, like, Ozzy's still going. They're like, so? I was like, damn. No, well, um, actually, the, the band now is more of a interest band for us where we, we meet every, like, let's say, Wednesday night and just jam together and have oh, a good cool. time. The reason is because we all accepted reality that look. Instead of giving us so much pressure to each other, like, oh, you got to prepare this, you got to practice that. We're like, you know what? Let's just have a good time. 
Sure. We've had our times performing. We've had great gigs. We've done different shows in different places. It was a lot of fun, but times have come, and you know what? Hey, let's so you're you're moving on from the music, pr- pretty I'm, much. I'm <laughs> moving on from the professional goal of being a musician sure. to a musician. That's just a musician. Okay, yeah. excellent. Good explanation of it. <laughs> uh, so you wear you do wear a, a lot of hats in Hong Kong. You're you're a comedian. You you act. You play music. You are also have your own business as yeah. a web designer exactly. and a graphic designer. Day. Yeah. And uh, but what's your dream job? Which one of these would you prefer to do? Well, to be honest with you, these are all pretty much my dream jobs. The reason why I I'm so greedy in the sense is that these are all the things I really want to do. I I really took a lot of time to think about it. Like, do I just want to be a comedian, or do I just right. want to do web design? And I really enjoy all of them. The struggle really isn't about which one do I want to do. It's how do I balance everything out. Like you can see, you hear from my voice. I'm not feeling very well today. The reason is because I got a bit too excited, and I was like, oh, I'm going to finish this project. I'm going to take on that project. Then tonight I'm going to do two gigs, and I'm going to go jam with my band after that. You know, I try to do too much at the same time. However. It really, it is my dream job. There's always been like the three aspects in my life, the music part, being a drummer, uh, doing comedy. It's always been like a dream as a dream come true. And web design where I'm expressing myself in a more visual way that the whole world can see. If you notice, actually, a lot of things that I do are more uh, selfish in a way where I don't really rely on other people. Like when I'm doing comedy, I'm on stage. It's me. It's my time. You know, it's really selfish in a way. However, there's a lot of preparation before that. With drumming, it's really I'm giving you the beat. You're following me. With web design, it's really I'm alone. It's my one-man company. So I'm not really relying on my accountant and my secretary. It's like, you know, I'll take care of everything. So um, in that sense, it's a very loner kind of thing. That's what I, like, even working out, I, I don't like trainers. I just like working out on my own or sure. even not, not with companions, just on my own. Okay. So you want to be able to pursue, pursue all of your interests and not necessarily restrict yourself to exactly. one Exactly. That's why Hong Kong is so good. Yeah, you, re- you really can Super fast-paced, get it done. Yep, for sure. All right, cool. So what can we expect from Vivek in the Year of the Snake? Well, there's a lot happening. I mean, right now, the focus is really to bring up the Cantonese scene here in Hong Kong to let people realize, first of all, there's a thriving scene. It's growing stronger and stronger in the sense that we've got more people coming to shows. We're trying to bring up more interest of people trying it, not just being an audience, but you know what? You can do it too. We're really hoping to drum up that interest of like, you know what, let me let me try. Let me just go up there and say something. Let's see what happens, you know. The interest, once we build up that interest, there's going to be a bigger community, more co- comedians, more choices for people, people to see. That's the Cantonese side. The English side for me really, I mean, I've, I've never been a big like in five years time I must do this kind of guy. I've always been a believer that if, I, if I'm better today than I was yesterday, that's good enough for me. I just compare it like that. I go on a day-to-day basis rather than like, oh, in 10 years' time, I want to be living in this house or I got to have that car, you know? I just want to know that as long as I'm working better today than I was yesterday, I'm good enough. Excellent. Um, so let me see. So uh, are there any other hobbies that you have that we haven't mentioned already? Um, no, I don't like collecting stamps. <laughs> I put the toilet seat down. No. That's a good that's hobby. That's about it, yeah. <laughs> for, for, yeah, basic things. Okay, cool. Uh, are there any other groups in Hong Kong or elsewhere that you're affiliated with that you would like to mention on the show? Um, I do donate to different organizations, but, you know, I mean, th- those are just like little side things. I, what a guy. Hey, hey, <laughs> it, it, don't ask me how much, though. That's not the key. The point is I donated. Yeah. No, um, I, I actually I work with different organizations, like a lot of NGOs, like, uh, for example, Equal Opportunities Commission. The interesting thing is that. Very often, they tell me to join them at these road shows where they go to different areas of Hong Kong and showcase different talents of ethnic minorities here in Hong Kong. And they always have me at the end to share about my growing up in Hong Kong. The interesting thing is that I'm not really sharing it to a local audience. I'm actually sharing it to ethnic minorities because they're hoping that the new generation of foreign kids will learn Cantonese and learn Chinese in Hong Kong. And a lot of the parents are worried that it's really difficult. So... I'm not going to let my kid learn it. So they want me to be an example of, look, I learned Cantonese and it's helped me so much, so give it a shot. Yeah, definitely. <coughs> I can only dream of being able to speak Cantonese. It would be uh, oh, it, it awesome. Would be but better than Superman. I'll pick up more and more as I as I go along. I'm here for the long haul. So Good enough, man. Hey, You're living you, in you the right You can be area. my role model. <laughs> You're in yeah. Long. You can, Cantonese is all over the place there. Oh, yeah. You, you do need it to get around to uh, order food and all. Like this to and survive, that. man. Survival Definitely. Cantonese is key. <laughs> Survival. That's why the first things I learned was how to order food and when the and all the curse words. So I knew when somebody was pissed off at me. Yeah, you don't <laughs> want to order someone who's saying curse words. To you. You're like, no, I'll take the other menu. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, all right. So I got one final question that I ask everyone, uh, and this is a question for people who are kind of new to Hong Kong um, and don't know the territory so well. But if you were here in Hong Kong for only 24 hours, if you were new to Hong Kong 
and you can only do one thing what would you tell people they have to do while they're here um okay it depends on your personality if you like crowds i would definitely say go do rush hour you got to do the rush hour train that is so hong kong oh the rush go, hour train yeah okay do a 6 p.m admiralty to chimps at choice that journey just do it just go there and be like wow <laughs> i this is wow yeah this is we'll do it on a friday evening and make sure at the end of that is uh mon Cox so exactly <laughs> exactly that and the key is this it's not really just about being packed in it's the ability to get into that train and somehow get off at the right station <laughs> if you can do that you experienced hong kong properly definitely it can be overwhelming i took a, i had a friend that was in town for chinese new year took him to the um causeway bay or no it wasn't was it causeway bay i don't know uh the fla flower market oh, no yeah, victoria, yeah. victoria park, park. Yeah, yeah, yeah victoria park oh yeah that's another Crazy. good example yeah <laughs> you go there you're like oh, take that just give me that oh. yeah. Yeah, yeah we yeah, went yeah. down one row and then my friend was like i think i've experienced yeah. this enough i get it <laughs> i get it so you just cram it in you're like exactly right yeah yeah that i mean chances are if if you if you live in hong kong that's a two minute journey going in rush hour in the trains but if you don't live here chances are you probably need the whole day to get off that train you just won't be able to get out people just ramming into you you're like i, just, I would get up i get on at six o'clock and it's already 10 what the hell you're screaming i'm, I'm yeah. going yeah I'm putting God, your hand please, up yeah, your face. whatever man you're, you're calling friends and everything like oh well i told you don't take the train not a rush hour messed up <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's all the uh questions i had for you thank you so much cool. thank you it was fun uh yeah i'm glad glad you were able to do the interview but i still got some other parts of the show here i'm hoping you can join me for uh first uh, a little game get to know you a little bit better it's called what's up or down hong kong all right and uh just 10 rapid fire items and you just say up if you like it or down if you're not really into it yep. so let's do it video games up dancing up in the club down legos up mondays up the harlem shake up obama up working out up in the gym up flying down classical music up suits down okay uh classical music you're a metal guy but you also enjoy uh, some the, the reason some is i realize that age has caught up onto me <laughs> in the sense that when i'm working and i'm like oh, it's so before, i'm just like you know what my clients are, are not gonna be very happy with those emails yeah no it's true i, I think. don't want to end my emails by saying rock on but when I was 13 or 14, classical music to me sounded awful. Like, I just didn't want to hear I it. I know. I, w I would <laughs> feel like I was my grandfather. I'm like, uh, guys, I'm cool. But now it is qu quite pleasant. Yeah, and you can't listen to hard rock all the time. Exactly. That's the thing. I, it, it really annoys me because I'm like, wow, I've become one of them. <laughs> I've become old. That's great. Uh, you realize at a point that everything in moderation really is the key. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, all right. So y you, uh, you like the Harlem Shake a lot? You enjoy those videos? I love those videos. I mean... I'll be honest with you, it has entertained me on days when I'm burnt out. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I can't think anymore. I'm watching like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, you just turn your brain off and just go like, <laughs> that's funny. Well, I find myself watching these like 25 minute, uh, or I oh, did when they first came the out, like the compilations. Yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. damn, these are all, I don't know if I'm, what am I expecting? Why am I watching this yeah. whole thing? <laughs> the, the, the thing I respect the most is that some guy actually went online, picked the ones he felt were the best, put them together, right. timed them so it's not too long where people lose interest. Put it on his website. I'm like, you know what? I respect you for that. People do a lot of that stuff where I'm like, I can't believe people are wasting their time doing this. I know. But uh, it's into entertaining us, I guess. That, so that's well, good. I appreciate it. Not into dancing in the club? No, I'm not a big dancer guy. I mean, as much as I'm Indian, the whole dancing doesn't fly for me. I'm a really bad dancer. People look at me. They're like, sir, are you okay? I'm like, I'm dancing. They're like, no, <laughs> we're not. You're having a vertical seizure. Exactly. You're <laughs> clearly just shaking. Not even the Harlem shake, sir. You're clearly just shaking. And we, we do not allow that in this club. We have style. And I'm like, uh, okay. So, yeah, I'm not, big, I'm not a big clubbing guy. You won't really see me down in the disco going like, yeah, what's up? If you do, it's another Indian. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might have misrecognized Yeah, you me. think it's Vivek. It's not yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, don't care for flying. Do you travel much? I do, actually. I have to fly, uh, let's say, in Singapore, to Singapore and Malaysia for, for different gigs every now and then. Sure. Um, not a big fan of it because it always was something cool. I'm like, wow, I'm going to fly on the plane. Now I'm like, you took the interest out of it where I'm like, I've got to go to work. Yeah. You know, are, are you doing the, have you done the 16-hour flight to the States? Yeah. I've yeah. done that to New York. I've done it to LA. And it's, it's, it's fun in a way that initially you're like, wow, you know, this is going to be cool. I'm going to watch movies, have some noodles. <laughs> it's going to be right. awesome. After two hours, you're like, what? You know what I like about being on the plane for so long is that it's that the only time in your life anymore where people really cannot get in contact with you. And yeah. You, and they, you don't have a care in the world really yeah. for that period of time because that is true. I can't I mean, do anything. I very much enjoy being on a plane without uh, people being able to contact me. The only thing that sucks really is that when you all, when you're on a plane, you always feel like you know what I want to research about this. You know what I want to look into this, and you're like I can't go online. 
I can't do anything. <laughs> right. I just got to sit here and imagine how it's going to be awesome. Then Although you, in the future, I think they will have that. They but that'll will, wreck my, yeah, that'll wreck what I was saying. Exactly. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but the cool thing is that, you know, 16 hours on a plane or at home is going to be the same. Just 16 hours of Harlem Shake. That's it. <laughs> Terrorita. Exactly. Whatever they <laughs> says. Uh, and suits. You're not a suit I'm guy. Not a big, You're wearing no, a jacket right now. Yeah, that's about all I will do with Classy. suits. Classy. Hey. <laughs> no, I mean, suits, the thing is that I... have I'm not a big suit guy in the sense that this has always been a dream of mine. Why I work for myself is that I don't ever want to have to wear a suit to work. Now, what if you got your own like late night talk show one day? Then, then they better then not have me here with a suit. Then <laughs> if they do. I'll be like, this better be a great show, or you you'll better be doing something you'll special. Say it's part of the in, in your contract. No suits. Yeah, no no suit. You know, I'm wearing sweatpants every day. Exactly. Just walk, <laughs> go to work. I'm like, hey, what's up? Nice. This is the no suit show. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, that was uh, that part of the show. Um, I think we're doing all right on time here. Let's uh, go into some old news, huh? Sounds good. All right. Uh, story number one, a conserv- conservative political party here in Hong Kong is campaigning against a liquor license for XXX Gallery. Uh, the gallery and, and club recently closed to change its location and cit- citizens near the new spot are up in arms. They're worried about drunk people in their neighborhood. But even without the liquor license, Triple X Gallery will allow people to bring their own booze. They have been BYOB for some time now um, at their previous location. Any, any thoughts? Have you been to Triple X Gallery? I've never before? been to Triple X. They, they put on th- some pretty interesting shows there. But oh, okay. I did notice that every show that they have is BYOB. So oh. I, I think it would help them out to actually get a liquor they probably, license. Do, do they own the 7-Eleven next door or something? Like They just go, like, hey, we'll outsource this to you guys. You they, know? Should, they should be getting some kickback I'm sure they probably do. Yeah, they, they probably like, to, uh, hike it up for tonight. We have a show. Just hike it up by a dollar, you know? But yeah, but what you're saying about 7-Eleven is true. I think there will be more people outside the club walking back and forth to the nearest convenience store. Yeah. So you're going to have more drunk people in the streets if they don't have the liquor license. Exactly. So if anything, they should sell nothing but liquor. Yeah. If anything, just say, just to encourage safety. They should sell hard liquor because, you know, that way they're just ordering one. Or t- the waiters don't have to run around as well, right? Just one drink, you're passed out, finish, you know. Yeah. You sleep there. What, what I would say is that, honestly, with the whole liquor license thing, ultimately the thing is that there are always going to be people like me who, if I ever go to one of these clubs, I, even if you have a liquor license, I'll bring my own booze. I'll hide it, and I'll ask <laughs> you for a glass. Yeah, a like, glass. Yeah, I need another glass, please. And you get the glass, I put, pour, pour it into the glass. I'm like, oh, yeah, could you fill this up, please? It's not enough. I need some ice. <laughs> just cheap it out completely, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I'm pro or against it. doesn't matter because I'll bring my own. Yeah. Well, in the end, I think it's just a political party trying to get some attention. Unfortunately, they're doing it by picking on a small business, which isn't I'm, really You know, cool. a business called Triple X. I'm just saying. Come <laughs> on, guys. Seriously. Yeah, maybe they picked a poorly yeah. chose their name. I know. I, was it's, like, I don't I think it's, it's supposed – I don't think it's that bad. Like, really. How did you come to the, this decision? You're like, tic-tac-toe, I win, Triple X. Let's go. Yeah, like, that's no. it. <laughs> Story number two, a poll on the South China Morning Post website showed that a majority of respondents favored a return to British rule over the current arrangement. Uh, the, the total at the time uh, I checked it out was 92% of the people said that they would prefer that. However, I would take it with a very large grain of salt as the papers in English it may not be representative of a majority of Hong Kongers. Um, I mean, how about a, ho- a third option they didn't even give for Hong Kong independence on its own? And uh, so, sorry for mentioning that, Vivek, because now we're probably not going to be enter- be able to enter the PRC anymore. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I, did, I didn't approve of this message. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not endorsed by Vivek. <laughs> but uh, seriously, the the poll question was framed in a way that makes it seem that Hong Kong can't take care of itself, <laughs> and everyone here should be wearing a helmet or something like that. There's that, or else what you could do is I would suggest technically what you do with the poll is you make it so that people can only vote for a certain answer, and whenever they vote for the other answer, there's like an error. <laughs> it right. doesn't work. Like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, it could be what happened. Yeah, it the was, program uh, doesn't allow it. Clearly, <laughs> you know, just you know, you can't blame the program. It's, it's technical. Yeah. So we don't need to get too political here. I just thought it was. Uh, oh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm not one of those pro or against like going back to any British rule or whatever. I mean, like I said back then, I would still not follow the rules. If the British tell me you must buy a drink, I'm like, no, I have a flask. Yeah. You know, I would still <laughs> follow the the cheapest way to get the job done. That's sure. just my nature and. Whatever your nationality is, whichever is cheaper, it's in my purse. I w- about my wallet. I'm yeah. a man. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> man. So whatever, whatever works out for me is, is, is the way I will go for it. Yeah. Well, I, I think I would be in favor of just baby steps. You know, uh, if they if the Hong Kong people could vote for their own chief executive, that's a yeah. step in the right direction. But I think the Chinese rule is okay at this point. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ultimately, the thing is, whoever does it, they're going to be in trouble. So. <laughs> right. Go for it, guys. Yeah, see what you get. Exactly. All right, uh, last story here. A 30-year-old man took a 62-meter plummet off of the Tsingma Bridge and lived to tell the tale. He's the first person to survive jumping off the bridge since it opened in 1997. He was, of course, trying to kill himself, uh, but I think this achievement should really bolster his self-esteem. 
and hopefully he gets a new lease on life after the incident. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, wh- what are you going to tell people? You know, it's like I I didn't die. <laughs> Look at me, I'm so good. You know? Yeah. Well, I, it, in one respect, he's a success, and he's done something that nobody else has ever done before. I, and I the w- other respect, he's a failure. I would challenge him to go bungee jumping. The idea that you have to do the same thing, but you will survive. And you're going to be coming back to reality. Can he do that? Because with jumping, this guy's luck, he would die doing the bungee jump. Well, the thing <laughs> is, is that he thought he would die, right? So he would only do half the journey. The other half is the toughest one, where you're down in the middle of nowhere and they're pulling you back up. If he can survive that as well, then I will listen to what he has to say. Otherwise, it's like, dude, come on, you you were really bad at aiming. <laughs> All right, come on. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks for taking part in those uh, strange and uh, uneasy old news uh, events. Um, so let's get into 10 events. Let's talk about what's going to be going on in Hong Kong this week. Yeah, it's, it's comedy all over the place this week. I I will actually be doing be part of the regular Cantonese shows that we have every Thursday down at uh, Fat Angelo's Restaurant in Minden Avenue in Chim Sa Choi. Oh, that's actually the every first event we were going to talk about. Stand-up oh, com- comedy featuring Vivek on March 21st at 8 p.m. There you go. Thursday, every Fat Thursday. Angelo's. That's right. That's Cantonese. So if you really want to challenge yourself and learn Cantonese, go for it. And it's I'll $120 to get in. Includes a drink, so That's it's right. well worth it. It's good, and you'll get a lot of jokes, too. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then, of course, if you say, you know what, Cantonese isn't my thing. I want to learn, hear some English stuff. Then, yeah, I have English shows coming up in the future. I believe it is the 23rd. Yeah, uh, no, not the 23rd. Wow. 20 this is how good I am 29th, at my schedule. 29th, I believe. Uh, just to remind the audience, I am a professional comedian. I should be knowing when <laughs> I should be... Going well, and you're jokes. not a, you're not an administrative assistant or anything. You're, exactly. you're a comedian. If anything, yeah, comedians should be very disorganized. You so can't take I your schedule that seriously. Exactly. If I did, then I wouldn't be that funny. Well, <laughs> let's get into some of the other comedy events here. Thursday, March 21st at 8 p.m. and Saturday, March 23rd at 9 p.m. You got stand up uh, a new headlining comedian coming from uh, the United States, Brad Upton. Brad Upton, first time in Hong Kong. Uh, he's from Las Vegas. He'll be at Champs on Thursday night. That's Champs Sports Bar in uh, the Charter House Hotel, Causeway yeah, Bay. Causeway Bay, Wan Chai area, and uh, he'll be at Takeout Comedy on Saturday night. Um, another comedy event coming up this week, probably the biggest one, Russell Peters, oh Friday, yeah. March 22nd and Saturday, March 23rd at 8 p.m. Uh, he'll be at Asia World Arena in Tung Chung. Uh, the first show sold out. I got my tickets. I'm I got my there. tickets. Okay, yeah. cool. And uh, check hkticketing.com for prices on the, uh, I think they still have some tickets left. They have the some for the 23rd. I like know. Front I checked row, it. I think. I know. I love checking ones. the website. Go like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I got mine. Yeah. Well, Russell Peters has reached Lady Gaga status, and that oh he's yeah. selling out shows, and they're adding more. Easy. And I, I actually <laughs> emailed uh, his manager, who's his brother, to try to see if he would be interested in doing a phoner on the yeah, show yeah, or yeah. something. And they came back to me and said, "Oh yeah, let's do a phone interview." And then I was like, "Oh sweet, that's that's great." But uh, haven't heard from him since, and I've sent him like three or four emails. So it's bad bad to hear, but uh, hopefully they'll get back to me. It'd be a nice little bonus episode yeah, exactly. if I could do like you know five ten minutes. That's all I would really yeah. care to do. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm going to see him anyway. Let me see. And we got a party to go along with that. The official Russell Peters after party at Play in Central. Russell and his two DJs, Spin Bad and Starting from Scratch, will be on hand. Uh, 11 p.m., $450 for men, $350 for ladies. Show your stub from the show and get a complimentary drink. Hitting up the after party, Vivek? I'll be outside with my picketing saying, we want equality. (laughs) We want equality. $100 discount. (laughs) That's true. It is kind of sexist. It's okay. There have been been people attempted in the United States, at least, to, to... to get rid of the ladies' nights on the grounds that yeah. it is sexist. Well, I, I, I'll i put it this way. Call it ladies' night, but make them pay. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but you know, the, what it's going to end up being in the end is that... It'll just be men. It, it'll be the same price for men, and then it'll be more expensive for ladies. Yeah. And then there'll be less ladies there. So That's true. It's I, not I, like they're going lo- to find the, medi- the mean price or the median price. I would say, look, like I said from the beginning, I'm not a big clubbing guy, so don't take <laughs> my word for it, please. <laughs> if you guys are cool with this, please, by all means. For me, I'll still, even if you get this equality going on, I'll still be at home reading my book. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> uh, sports event, big one coming up this week from the 22nd fr- on Friday through Sunday. The ultimate. The Hong Kong Sevens yeah. at Hong Kong Stadium. Good luck scalping tickets if you want to get in. I have a feeling there's not much li- this left. I, this, I believe, is the warm-up to Halloween, where everyone dresses up. 
Yeah, that's true. Every, that's I've heard already heard from people I know that oh, I'm going to be busy this weekend making my costumes yeah. for the for the uh, sevens. People are serious about it. I mean, the costume, not the rugby is like whatever. Yeah, it's right there. You know. Yeah. Oh, look at that team in one yay! But look at your costume. Wow. <laughs> you know, people are huge. Yeah. Are you going to the sevens? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. I'll be at home reading my book. Okay. Get cool. off my lawn. No, there you go. Are you into rugby? Not really big on the rugby thing. Again, team sport, right? Team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's see. We got some other party events coming up for the Sevens this week. Thursday, March 21st, uh, Carlsberg Rugby Sevens Flip Cup Championship at play in Central, 9.30 p.m. Get together your team of seven people, and 16 teams will compete uh, to and represent their home country in Flip Cup. Sign-ups open at 9 p.m., so get there early. Do you mean home country like Central, Wan Chai, North <laughs> Point? It should, yeah. That's uh, I'm gonna. I would represent you and Long. Yeah, you, good luck in getting six other people. <laughs> right. Uh, have you played much flip cup? Did you uh, do no. Again, games? book corner. <laughs> get off my lawn. All right. <laughs> yeah. You see this? I keep this now. That's when right. kids hit balls into your your yard. Thank you. <laughs> that's what she said. Right. Okay. Party event on Friday, March twenty second, and it's going uh, each night through Sunday, the twenty fourth at eight p.m. The Louis Roder Champagne Tent After Party at the Indian Recreation Club in Causeway Bay. Three hundred dollars to get in. For more info, check out ironmongerevents.com. Interesting. Uh, another party for sevens related. Saturday, March twenty third, eight thirty p.m. The Ultimate Hong Kong Rugby Sevens After Party at Armani Privé. In Central, $200 includes one drink, put on your sevens costume, and take part in the best dressed competition. The last two events this week don't have to do with comedy or or the sevens, uh, but they're, they're they're kind of a sexy events. We got exotic dancing Saturday, March 23rd at 8:15 p.m. The Chippendales Asia Tour Hong Kong 2013 at the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center in Wan Chai. The world's most loved exotic male dancers. Tickets starting at $480. Wow, hot stuff. Wow. Uh, and then uh, the last one, art and photography uh, through April 1st. So this is going to be ongoing, and they open at noon each day. Uh, City Erotica at In Between Shop in Causeway Bay. Local photographer Donald Lung presents his exhibition on sexuality in Hong Kong, taken using black and white film and with a preference for street shooting and natural light. So I thought that was an alternative that uh, guys and girls could enjoy together. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, Look definitely. at still pictures. <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in Hong Kong each week. I wish we could talk about it all. But it's we highlight some cool events, and hopefully yep. people will enjoy that. And uh, so that's going to take us into the very last uh, section of the show before plugs here. And that's the game we always play called 5Q. All right. And that's just where I ask you five questions. Some of these questions may or may not have something to do with Vivek Mabubani, our guest. So uh, let's go into question number one. We'll keep track of your score. Mm -hmm. If you took South Park's Chinese restaurant and replaced the word walk with university, what would you have? It would. I would have the place I studied in, City University. Oh, uh, yes, a shitty university. That's right. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, exactly. That's what I did study in. It was <laughs> shitty. Where, where Vivek got his Bachelor of Arts degree in creative media and an associate's degree in media technology. Fantastic. Yep. And how, so you, did you enjoy your time there? I, I enjoyed not being in school. Okay. All the classes I skipped, that was, that was the memories I would have about university life. I still enjoy being able to say, I'm done with school. No more school. I know. <laughs> I, I, I said that when I was six years old. I'm, I'm done with school. Parents were like, no, you're not. I'm like, oh, good, man. <laughs> All right. So uh, you're one for one. Good job. Uh, question number two. What would be the opposite of the phrase dawn of virtue? The opposite of dawn of virtue would be the sunlight of cha cha tang. I have no idea. Dawn of virtue. Dawn of virtue. That would be like the the morning of sin. Well, dawn. It would be the opposite. The sunrise. No, sorry. What I'm saying. The sunset. The opposite. Of sin. The opposite of dawn. You see, I went to a local Chinese school. Our <laughs> English was very bad. I did go to a this shitty is a university. Tough one. Uh, so you're you're very close. I would have to say I'm gonna say with my heavy Indian accent. <laughs> It, okay. Yeah. See? Uh, you, were, you were close with one of those things. Do you give up? Sunset of sin. Okay. You're getting close. Sundown of sin. Eve of sin. Oh, there ah. you go. Oh, you're talking about my own band. No, wow, it was actually Dusk of Badness. Sorry. Oh. No, no. Eve of Sin, hey. uh, the band in which you are a drummer. I need to know myself better. <laughs> oh, well, we'll see. Uh, so you're two for two now. This is going well. I uh, see how this game works. See, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you are in a heavy metal band, which this is, this is actually not really having to do so much with you. 
Which metal is actually heavier, lead or mercury? Mercury. It's actually lead. Sorry. Oh, you said heavy. You see, my English is very poor, <laughs> so I thought heavier means lighter. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, you, I need use easier words. You know, like you gotta speak it slow. Which metal more I li- heavy? I like. I like how convincing you are. I'll give hey. you half a point on that <laughs> one. Uh, the atomic weight of lead is two oh seven, where mercury's weight is two hundred. Didn't you memorize the periodic table of elements? I Come did on, not go man. to school much. <laughs> That's my memories of education. Right. Gotcha. All right. Well. Uh, so what? We got two and a half now. Who? Uh, question number four. Who is the youngest ba- uh, Brady sister on the show, The Brady Bunch? Uh, L- Lil Brady. Lil Brady. Lil like Lil Kim. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. I didn't watch the Brady Brady. Oh, Bunch. you didn't watch that show. I oh, I, I, I might want people off my lawn. Okay. But no, I didn't. Uh, I'm gonna throw out some names. Shaniqua. Okay. Uh, not not too far off there. <laughs> Shamina. Uh, I have no idea. Think uh think your 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 background, your ancestry. Uh my background it's a name. Cindy? Cindy. Cindy, exactly. Uh, Cindy Brady. Good job. I just wanted to give you more airtime. <laughs> that, that's really I mean, I knew the yeah, Cindy, come on. Everyone knows Cindy Brady. Yeah, easy. Yeah, it's easy. Just, English is not my is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh so Vivek is of Cindy descent. Uh yep. how was it growing up in uh, well no, I already asked you about that. Yeah. We only know. <laughs> Um, I mean, what I I don't really know. What's the difference between uh, Cindy and and uh, your other other Indian people? Oh, um, I'm sorry, you are asking me? Oh, okay. Yeah, do you no, know? Yeah, oh, I do. I uh, think well, Cindy's actually like a Pakistani region. Uh, when, you're, when, when you're in Pakistan, okay. I mean, we were. Well, yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, um, uh, this is a very sensitive topic. Oh, okay. no, well, um, a lot of Cindy's in Hong Kong are more business people. So a lot of them, they will bargain your head off. So you're better at Bargaining? business than regular other Indian people, I guess. I yes. Okay, good. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, send if you're a, a, a non cindy Indian, send your hate mail to Vivek Mabubani. <laughs> at, okay. Uh, so <laughs> <At> good. Travis, <laughs> what's up, Hong Kong dot org. Three, three and a half points. You're doing really well here. So Thank we're you. on right. to uh, question five. In two thousand and eight. Who had the best mobile financial services in Hong Kong? Three. Three? <laughs> no, three was the worst. Best mobile financial services oh, mobile in Hong financial Kong? Services? In 2008. Wow, you have totally stumped me. I, I can tell jokes. I'm good at jokes. Uh, in 2003, the best mobile finance service? 2008. Oh, 2000. Oh, that's a whole different game then. Now, should I mean, be. If you clarify it that way, I'm sure to know the answer. Because, <laughs> I mean, it has to be the, you know, it's that. It's a bank. Th- uh, yeah, exactly. Those guys. Come on. You <laughs> must know like HSBC, Citibank. Uh, yeah, HSBC. Final answer, HSBC. Yes. Uh, no, it's Citibank, of course. I because they hired Vivek yeah, exactly. to endorse yeah. their services. That's <laughs> why I said Citibank. Is it too late for them to get that money back? Oh, the website's down. Oh, okay. <laughs> but so <laughs> I'm just saying... <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that did have something to do with you, and that was. I really wish I did some research about myself. You see, <laughs> this is how humble I am. I don't Google myself every day. Yeah, hence <laughs> the reason how I'm failing well, at this game. Completely. I don't think you that necessarily makes people humble. I think it, oh. if they do Google it themselves them every ignorant. day, they're neurotic <laughs> and paranoid. <laughs> uh, so three and a half points, very good actually hey, for this game. Most people for get someone who like went two. <laughs> local English school. I mean, sorry, local Chinese school. English not first language, so it's very difficult. Oh. For me to speak like this to you, I am very tired. Andrew is Andrew. Hey, here? oh, there's the <laughs> hey, again. Me again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, well, thank you for letting me know myself better. Yeah, no, yeah. We're, I we're educating pe- uh, everyone who's listening and me. yourself. Yeah. Wow, thank you. I'm hitting hitting the research hard here, <laughs> but uh, thank you for submitting to that silly game. And now let's just break into plugs and wrap it up here. Um, Vivek's uh, new show in English, cl- n- next show in English is on Friday, March 29th at Takeout Comedy in Soho at 9 p.m. So make sure to check that out. You can go to takeout, uh, takeoutcomedy.com. God, I can't even talk today. Takeoutcomedy.com and uh, find uh, you know the schedule of all the events happening and all the shows and find Vivek's name on there. He will also be present at Takeout Comedy's 1,000th show on April 13th. So yep. everyone should definitely check that out. It's only $100 to get into that show. They got a nice discount. And uh, I imagine it's going to be packed in here. Yeah. And uh, check out funnyvivek.com for more 
info on Vivek's upcoming shows. Find out uh, how you can hire him out. If you have a speaking engagement, you might want to hire him for. Or or remember, I am Cindy, so bargaining <laughs> gonna be gonna be strong. <laughs> yeah, well, the Chinese people and the Indian people are very. Oh, uh, it's on. Yeah, I mean, anyone is who's listened to Russell Peters before. Exactly, knows they all would about know this. These yeah. two people doing business. Oh, it's a sitcom. <laughs> it's great. Uh, and you can also c- contact him for your web design and development needs. And that's just yep. VivekMabubani.com? Exactly. Okay, very cool. And by the way, uh, we, maybe we should spell it out. It's V-I-V-E-K-M-A-H-B-U-B-A-N-I. You'll be able to find the name on uh, on my website. Yeah, so there you go. If you're checking out SpeakHK. Or just smash your keyboard. Just a <laughs> <laughs> If it has just a letter it B, down. it's going to be right. Yeah, I think you'll, you'll get there eventually. You'll, yeah, exactly. It's like 10,000 monkeys. When there's monkeys. a will, there's a way. <laughs> There you go. And uh, follow him on Twitter at Vivek Mabubani. Yeah, or Facebook, add me over there. And what's your Facebook? Is it Uh, slash? Vivek Mabubani. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty pretty simple stuff. It's all about me. Pretty simple stuff, folks. Yeah. (laughs) All right. And as far as the show here, uh, subscribe to the show, uh, What's Up Hong Kong, on iTunes, and put us in your favorites folder. Uh, on Stitcher, if you listen to us on Stitcher, and on both of those, leave ratings and reviews. It would help us out tremendously. Don't forget to check out Speak HK's other podcast, uh, Dear HK. New episodes every Wednesday, so it'll be tomorrow if you're listening to this on Tuesday. And uh, contact me at TravyJ, T-R-A-V-V-Y-J, at SpeakHK.com if you have any events you'd like me to promote here on the show. Um, Tweet at SpeakHK on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Speak.HK. Like us there. And, uh, yeah, that's a, that's pretty much it. So is there anything else you want to tell the listeners before we get off of here? Get off my lawn. Okay. so let, we'll, <laughs> well, it's come <laughs> to a comedy show, but get off my lawn. Okay. So c- come to the dank basement, get off the lawn. Exactly. Okay. Very cool. It's like a rap song. Get off the lawn. Get off the lawn. Come to the dank babes. Get off the lawn. Sounds like a Fresh Prince song. Or maybe like Hot Boys. It could be. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining Vivek. My pleasure, it's been man. awesome. And uh, for Vivek Mabubani, this is Travis Jones signing off. That's what's up.